I would like to request Chief Justice that two percent quota for all in colleges and universities is implemented, but in the professional colleges it is yet not been implemented. So finally, I have overlooked it. And now I request Chief Justice, Mr. Justice Umar Tabandyal, to come forward to deliver his speech. With a big round of applause. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I am a judge. We are here to celebrate one of our former luminaries from the Supreme Court. So I start with a verse of the Holy Quran, which speaks about justice and also talks about judges. This is from Surah Al-Nisa, verse 135. O believers, be upholders of justice and bearers of witness to truth for the sake of Allah. Even though it may be either against yourselves or against your parents and kinsmen or the rich or the poor, for Allah is more concerned with their well-being than you are. Do not then follow your own desires, lest you keep away from justice. And now for us, if you twist or turn away from the truth, know that Allah is well aware of all that you do. Justice Cornelius was an embodiment of justice. He was, it's not been mentioned to you, I'll just share this with you. He stood first in the examinations administered by the Allahabad University for matriculation, for intermediate and for BSc honours. He was a graduate in mathematics, physics and chemistry. And at a young age of about 23 years, he was selected by the premier service of India, the, in, the Indian ICS, the Indian Civil Service. The finest men and women were selected there. And he, thereafter, he went to Selwyn College, Cambridge, where again he excelled. What I'm impressing upon you is that such a brilliant man who was in the civil service, who would have reached the heights of prominence in the policy-making circles, in the administrative circles, within four years, said no to all that. And in 1930, he joined the judiciary. In the judiciary, at a very young age of, uh, I would say, some, uh, sometime in his 30s, he was selected, uh, he was elevated to the High Court. I'm sorry, there's so much, <laughs> so many microphones, I can't even hold this. <laughs> uh, what do I do? Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll have to minimize my requirements. So, he went, he was elevated to the judiciary at the age of 41 in the High Court, Lahore High Court. Within seven years, ladies and gentlemen, he distinguished himself and he was elevated to the federal uh, court of Pakistan. I have spent a total of 19 years in the judiciary in the High Court and the Supreme Court. 
Justice Cornelius spent 17 years in the Supreme Court of Pakistan. He was one of the longest serving Chief Justices of Pakistan from 1960 to 1968. And in times that Pakistan was an embryonic state, it was growing, it was uh, trying to grapple with all the difficulties of a young country. And of course, there were political issues. In 1955, Justice Cornelius, who was by then in this, it was called the Federal Court. In the following year, when the Constitution came, it became the Supreme Court in 1956. In the Federal Court, he was the lone voice which said that the dissolution of the Assembly, Constituent Assembly, by the Governor General was illegal. That judgment today is hailed as an outstanding rendition of justice for the reason that the majority decided that the Sindh High Court did not have the jurisdiction to decide the matter. And therefore, no, there was no judgment of the uh, Sindh High Court which could be assailed. It was an illegal judgment. The majority allowed technicality to avoid the truth. And when truth was avoided, justice was avoided. Today, one man's voice is celebrated in our circles. The rest of the men, although they include many distinguished jurists, the majority are not mentioned at all. This is the course of history and this is the message to any judge who wants to stay on the right course. The course written for us, dictated to us, directed to us by none less than the Almighty through the Holy Quran. Today I am informed that he stayed in one room for 40 years. He lived there simply. He had no assets when he retired and from his pension he paid the bills of this hotel. It was in this hotel where he lived. And I went and saw that room just now, a short while ago. But another beautiful thing about it, in 1968, he was to retire in May of 1968. But his colleague, Justice S. A. Rahman, who had worked with him for years in the Supreme Court, was to retire uh, before then. So in order that Justice S. A. Rahman may become Chief Justice also, do you know what Justice Cornelius did? Two months prior to his retirement, he resigned from office. He sacrificed. This was a man who had the capability to give and to share. These are the qualities which I submit respectfully, judges must have if they have to do justice. I feel inspired by the gentleman because he wrote brilliant judgments also. I just mentioned you the 1955 judgment or in the Tamizuddin case. Then there was this famous Doso case in 1958, which was the which is the one that um, legitimized martial law for the first time in Pakistan. But an offshoot before the court in that case was whether uh, fundamental rights that had been violated prior to the martial law and the cases were pending in the courts, whether those petitions 
would abate or continue to be enforced. The general tendency was that everything is closed. This, the constitution is abrogated and a new legal order has started. But Justice Conyers wouldn't believe that. He said, but this happened before the abrogation took place. These rights for fundamental rights accrued and were claimed before the uh, abrogation took place. So even after the abrogation, those fundamental rights will be enforced. And this is the way the gentleman conducted himself. He, he did something similar in uh, Abul Ala Maudoudi's case in 1964. Two provinces in the country at that time, East Pakistan and West Pakistan, decided to abolish the Jamaat Islami. It was an executive order, opinion of a government servant or an executive officer, whoever it was, declared that this political party should be abolished. There was one view projected by the government that uh, this that the fundamental rights did not protect the uh, uh, party and that the opinion given was reasonable, it was fair, it could be seen, it could be determined and therefore no intervention, interference should take place. Justice Collins held that this case does not concern the propriety of the auto only. This case concerns the fundamental right of freedom of association. And if the political right to associate has been defeated in this party's case, then that's a breach of the fundamental right. And no executive officer, no government authority can sit in judgment on the fundamental right. It is the court which does that. And the result was they lifted the ban. The Supreme Court was together on that. He was the Chief Justice at the time. They lifted the ban. I could say much more about him, but I want to move ahead. I want to move to the subject which may be of interest to you. And this is the subject of minority rights in Pakistan. Thank you, Jan. Our constitution, as Ms. Sabahat just told us, assures freedom to profess religion, to manage religious institutions, subject to public order and morality. Our constitution in Article 21 safeguards uh, particular religions against taxation for the purposes, uh, sorry, it safeguards against taxation for purposes of any particular religion. So for no particular reason can other religions be taxed. Article 22 safeguards educational institutions in respect of religion, etc. No religious instruction or ceremony in educational institution other than one's own religion is to be given to the students. No citizen can be denied admission to educational institutions which receives aid from public revenues on the ground of race, religion, caste, place or birth. Basically, our constitution says everyone is free to profess their religion. All citizens are, have equal rights, there is no discrimination amongst them. And yet, for years, our minorities have felt discriminated, have felt sidelined, marginalized. It is in these circumstances in the year 2014, some nine years ago, 
the Supreme Court under the charge of Chief Justice Tasadu Ghazan Jilani, who sits with us right here, took up this challenge and came up with directions to protect the rights of the minorities. There were several directions that were issued. Directions about curriculum, directions to ensure that there is no hate speech on social media against minority religions, directions that a National Council for Minority Rights be established, a task force be established, and a special police force be established to protect religious places of worship. A job quota for minorities at 5% be ensured, and similarly an admission quota in educational institutions be ensured. For many years, this these directives were carried out under the charge of Mr. Shweb Sattu, who sits right here. That was a one-man commission. He worked strenuously, selflessly, and achieved many objectives. I may agree with Sabahat, there's a lot more to be done. But pursuant to that judgment, there was movement and a great deal was done. Today, the minorities see that judgment as an umbrella which protects their rights. Today, the Supreme Court acts as a facilitator vis-a-vis -vis the government authorities who have been cooperative. We must not overlook the fact, ladies and gentlemen, we have been through at least three decades of extremism. We have lost 80,000 citizens in this country to extremism. And by the grace of God, the situation is improving. And a lot of the complaints regarding violence which the minorities had, and even, even Muslims had, because of sectarian uh, rivalries, they have diminished. I think that is that resilience which the Pakistani nation has shown through these turbulent times is a great credit to the people of Pakistan. And with great respect, also the state of Pakistan. Things are on the mend. A task force which is, uh, was not in existence has come into being recently on 16th of November 2022 under the chairmanship of the additional secretary, Ministry of Religious Affairs and Interfaith Harmony. The members of the task force include almost all important executive functionaries in the country which means that the issues relating to minorities' protection and minorities' rights would now be handled by persons who, who are directly related and who have uh, authority over the persons that will carry out the instructions. I have hope and expectation that this task force will do well. Our association with Mr. Sadl continues because he's a court appointee. The court has a special implementation bench. Nine years have passed, but there is an implementation bench for this judgment. And today I've been mentioned a few issues. I said, file an application. You see, courts cannot pass executive orders. We cannot act on verbal statements or complaints. These matters come to us through petitions or applications. Each notice is issued to the concerned parties and respondents come forward and an order is passed after hearing the parties. But these are public interest proceedings. There's nothing adversarial about that. 
and I may assure you, uh, for quite some time I was the chairman of the implementation bench. Now it is headed by someone else. And uh, uh, we always found cooperation from the government of Pakistan, as well as the provincial governments. So, nothing to despair about. Be positive and inshallah, we'll progress further in this direction. You see, the protection of minority rights, the protection of rights of different sects within the fold of Islam All this has to do with awareness and knowledge. You will be pleased to know that the Islamic faith does not appreciate sectarianism. There are several verses of the Quran that talk about it. And it is said that leave this, these differences to God. Don't fight amongst yourselves. What you have to do is Amar bil Maruf wa Nahi anil Munkar. Amar bil Maruf is do good deeds. Nahi anil Munkar is others who do bad deeds just inform them and tell them don't do this. You don't have to become violent. You don't have to become aggressive, but you should stop that. You should advise that. In relation to uh, religion, the Surah Bakara in Ayat 256 says, there is no compulsion about religion. There is no compulsion in faith. This is your own will, your own wish. In uh, uh, Surah Maida, it is number 5, Surah 5, Ayat 32, it is said, whoever kills one person unjustly is as though he has killed all of mankind. And whoever saves one life, it is as though he has saved all mankind. Mankind, whatever the form, whatever the color, whatever the creed, whatever the faith, is indistinguishable. There is no discrimination. That is how the Almighty considers human beings. In Surah Al-Anam 6, Surah 6, 108, the Almighty says, Do not denigrate the deities of other faiths. Lest their ignorance, in their ignorance, they disrespect Allah. Thus, Allah has made pleasing to every community their deeds. Let them do their deeds, their religious deeds. In Surah Hajj 22, Ayat 40, he says, due to, due to the intervention of Allah, to protect the places of worship of other faiths, the people who were confronting and fighting with each other did not destroy those places of worship. God intervened to prevent the destruction of places of worship. This is how important they are. This is how important the right of worship is. And so on. There's more, but I will not spend more time on that. What uh, I would now turn to is the judiciary, is the institution to which Justice Cornelius belongs or belonged, the heritage that is left behind, the lessons that we can learn from him. We have a duty, ladies and gentlemen, under the Constitution and pursuant to our oath to preserve, to protect, and to defend the Constitution. 
This is our bounden duty. The highest law in the country and this duty we perform with utmost commitment and sincerity. The force of judgments that we give must be in accordance with the Constitution and the law. And when that is the case, our judgments have a moral authority. Just like the words of the Bible have my moral authority, just like the words of the Holy Quran have moral authority. Moral authority comes from something which is good, something which is pure. Our judgments have the force of moral authority when they are given in accordance with the constitution and the law of Pakistan. When, when do judgments have moral authority? Ladies and gentlemen, they have moral authority when they are passed on the merits of the case. Otherwise, otherwise in Tamizuddin's case, 1955, dissolution of the Constituent Assembly, the majority said, Sindh High Court didn't have jurisdiction. So they couldn't go to the merits of the case. Justice Cornelius said no. The Constituent Assembly is an organ higher than the Governor General's wishes and discretion to give assent. The, it was said that the Sindh High Court doesn't have jurisdiction because the law under which they are doing this is does not did not have the assent of the Governor General. And by doing so, by declaring that that assent was not necessary, the learned single judge, the dissenting judge, Mr. Justice Cornelius, held that the dissolution of the Constituent Assembly was illegal and unconstitutional. That judgment survives today as an example because it was on the merits of the case. Whenever we resort to technicality, our focus is shifted elsewhere. I'm not talking about Pakistan. I'm talking about all over the world. All over the world, one comes up with objections that such and such judgment is weak because it does not deal with the real issue. And when it comes to constitutional enforcement, we must not blink our eyes. If it says 90 days for holding elections, it is our duty to say that. It is not our choice. It is not our choice. It is our duty to say that. Instead of finding a reason why we should avoid to say that. This is what has happened. You call it controversy. I'm sorry, I'm not worthy of controversy. I'm a very humble person. You say you support us, please don't say that. I'm just one of the members of the Supreme Court of Pakistan. If you stand up for the Constitution and the law, then you must support the Supreme Court of Pakistan. And not any individual. We have no existence individually. Our existence is as a unit, as a constitutional organ. And that is how we function. But the important thing is that the Supreme Court, when it speaks on merit, its judgment has moral authority. That becomes even more important when those judgments are not appealed or no review is filed. Then that means no one has any objection to the judgment. If a review is filed, then it will be heard 
because no judgment is binding unless it becomes final. But if a judgment is not challenged, then it becomes final. So let's see what happens now. Let's see what happens now. And uh, I am optimistic that the people of Pakistan, the leaders of Pakistan, the institutions of Pakistan are all committed to the Constitution. Do you know that in this context, the leaders of Pakistan, the political leadership of Pakistan agreed to start negotiations, which have not ended yet. This is what we were informed. We have nothing to do with that. But at least they are conscious that they have a duty to comply the Constitution. And we are there to support that effort. Otherwise, our judgment is there. It has a force of its own. It may not be implemented today, but it will last through the test of time and shall be implemented. Now, not much more to say except to thank our hosts, Mr. Samuel Piare, where is he? Mr. Samuel Piare, the Honorable Bishop, the uh, pastors and the bishops and I don't remember exactly what your offices are but uh, it's a matter of privilege to be here. I haven't told you that one of the most respected citizens of Pakistan for whom thousands of people have love and affection is sitting here amongst us. He is devoted to education because he feels, and rightly so, that education is the source of progress for the individual and for his community and for society as a whole because he comes back and shares his education. Who has given away money, time, effort, love, support, everything to students for, him, for giving them good education. He is the founder of one of the best institutions, academic institutions in the country, which started as a business school but today offers engineering, law. Tomorrow it will be medicine, I'm sure. I'm not sure if it is, there's a medical school yet or no. Not yet. And I'm talking about Sayyid Baba Ali. Let's give him a... It's uh, delightful to meet wonderful people. And uh, as Sayyid Babar Ali had a role in my life also. So thank you, sir. <clears throat> my other great benefactor sits here, Justice Tasadu Jilani totally committed to the law, so gentle and so refined, such a good example of judicial character, conduct, bearing and delivery. I salute him also because one of the great advantages in life or blessings of life is when you have heroes to look up to. So I am very lucky in that respect. Within my profession, within my vocation of judges and my profession of the law amongst lawyers, I have come across such outstanding people. I cannot stop thanking the Almighty for those associations. This is a memorable occasion for me. Thank you very much, all of you. My best wishes. 
and uh, the implementation bench is always there. File an application and let's see what happens.